let's have a look at observational versus experimental studies and what the differences are. So in an observational study, and you can see I've got a little diagram here to try and explain what's happening. So in an observational study, students themselves choose whether or not they wish to play sports. Okay, So I just go out and I watch a group of students who are playing sport and I give them a fitness test and look at the results. Then I find another group of students who don't play sports and I go and give them a fitness test and I observe to see is there any difference in the fitness test results. Okay, Now I'm simply observing what I see or collecting observational data. Because the results could be due to underlying differences between the two groups themselves, we can't be sure that these groups, that the group of people who play sport and the group of people who don't play sport, we can't be sure that these two groups are similar. All right. Um, so that is one of the key ideas, is that in an observational study, the two groups that we're comparing may not be similar. Okay. So it might be that the, in the group of people that play sport, they happen to all be really people with really, really long legs. Whereas the people that don't play sport might happen to be the a lot group of people that have short legs. It might be the people that play sport have a better um, have bigger lungs than those that don't play sport. We just simply don't know. Um, and therefore, because these two groups are not comparative, we can only make inferences. So observational studies, you can only make inferences. I suggest that playing people who play sport are more likely to be fitter, but I cannot prove that. I can't show, I don't have really strong evidence to be able to show that doing playing sport will make you fitter. Whereas if I'm doing an experiment, okay, and this is a different setup, so what it does is it starts with a whole group, one group of people all at the beginning. So one group of people. And we randomly allocate them into these two different groups. They either go into the treatment group or the control group. And I'm going to make one group of these people play sport every week. And I'm going to make the other group of people not play sport. And then I'm going to look and see what their fitness test results are at the end. But because I have randomly allocated every one of these people into these two groups, these two groups should be similar. Okay, they should be similar in all of their characteristics. Um, so that is a really vital part of being able to do an experiment, is to be able to show that these two groups are very similar and the only thing that is different so I'm going to control everything else, but the only thing that is different is the fact that one group played sport and the other group didn't. Okay, so in an experiment, we can show cause and effect. And the reason that we can show that doing this causes this to happen is because of that random allocation component. And that's what makes this the gold standard. Okay, so if we have an experiment and that is far more, the results of that are far more powerful than an observational study. So here's a little um, a bit more explanation here. Then an experiment must change only one thing between the groups that are being studied. studied. All other things, all other conditions must be controlled. Now let's just have a look, we're going to have a look at some design principles of what things that we can do to help control all of these components. So when we plan our experiment, we want to have controlled conditions. So for example here, we can see that we've got group A, group B, and group C. Now these are three, if you can see there, there's three different scenarios going on. So each monkey is not getting the same conditions. Okay, and because they, each monkey has a different condition, that means it is not being controlled. All right, so we want to make things controlled. We want to have all conditions exactly the same except for the one thing we're testing. 
So variability is another component. The, by We want to reduce and minimize the variation. And that's why we want to have larger group sizes if possible. We want to keep conditions constant um, and do all of those things to control things because it is going to reduce the variation. So control group. This is one of the big ideas. Experiments usually have a control group and that group either gets no treatment or gets an existing treatment. And then we are looking for the differences between those groups. Okay, um, and as I talked about in the previous vocab video, if I was going to compare a new treatment, cancer treatment, with the current cancer treatment, then her, whatever the current treatment is, that would be your control group. So repeated measurements. So there are times when it's going to be appropriate to repeat the assessment multiple times or make a person take the test multiple times okay so there for example I've got some plants and they're just getting exactly the same test being done on them each time so if I was to make a student sit a math test again and again and again and again then that would be or getting repeated measures and then I've got means I get a much better understanding of how much variation there is in one single experimental unit the random allocation, that's one of the key things, is that we have to, um, we need to do random allocation. If you don't do that, that's not an experiment and you'll fail the standard. And the reason we're doing it is we want to make sure that both groups are very similar in all the characteristics except for the one thing we're testing. So we want to have a mixture of ethnicities, a mixture of gender, a mixture of time of day, a mixture of different environments. We want to have as much commonalities between the groups as possible all right so that random allocation how do we actually go about randomly allocating there's an, lots of different ways that we can do it one way is to go and get piece of paper with a or b written on them if they are in if then we put them all into a bag if they pull out an a they're in that group if they pull out the b they're in that group you could also use a deck of cards and say, right, if you get a black card, that means this, and if you get a red card, that means that. Toss a coin, heads for one group, tails for the other group. Rolling a dice, if you've got a one, two, or a three, you're in one group, versus getting a four, five, or six, you're in the other group. So there's lots of different ways that we could randomly allocate. Here's an example. If I have 30 students that I want to put into two groups, I want to have roughly even numbers in both, so I'm going to choose 15 black cards and these are going to represent group 1. Then I'm going to get 15 red cards and that represents group 2. I then need to make sure that they are randomly mixed up, so I'm going to shuffle the cards to make sure that they are in a random order. Then I go up to my first student, give them a card. If it is black, they're going to go to group 1 and if it's red, they're going to go into group 2. And I'm going to hand out a card to every single student. And so they've either got a red or a black. And then I'm going to say, right, all the red cards, you come in to this group. And everyone that's got a black card, you come over into that group. Okay, so that's a way of writing some instructions to randomly allocate people into two, these two groups. Another thing that you need to think about in design is your sample size. Now, if we have a very small sample size... The good thing about that, it's not going to take us very much time to collect the data. However, if you've only got two or three pieces of information, there's not a lot that you can do with that. So we want to find a better balance. So the opposite end is if I had a massive great big sample, it's going to take me a long time to collect all the data, but I'm going to have a lot of very, very good data, which will then be much more precise. So what I really want to do is I want to find some kind of compromise. I want to find something that's not too big, that's going to take forever, but it's not too small. I need enough data to be able to do stuff with it. And so we want to try and have as many participants as we can. And I usually say that I want you to aim to have at least 30. Okay, that's a good number to aim for in each group. 
Okay, now the last bit is looking at there are two types of experimental design that we cover at level two. Level three only does the two independent groups. But level two, we can do either of these. Now it might be that your teacher just chooses one method or the other method. Some teachers will do both. That's up to the teacher to make that decision. So we've got these two types. One where you've got a paired comparison. So that's when you have the same goldfish getting two tests done on them. Okay, so that would be a paired design. Whereas if I was doing a two independent group, so I've got one group of people in the treatment group and a completely different group of people in the control group. So it's each person is only doing one test.